Welcome to Ann Arbor Marketing, Elliot's Run for short. Uh, my name is Derek Marabon from Ingenix Digital Marketing. This is Dee Davey from Creative Ideas Marketing. Did I say that right? And, and uh, this is Lam. We come here every week, and even on beautiful days, and we have really good speakers. So is there anyone here for your very first Lunch Ann Arbor Marketing? Welcome, sir. Thanks for coming. How'd you find out about us? Okay, good. Tech time, wonderful. Um, so just so you all know, we do have a LinkedIn presence, a LinkedIn group, and a Facebook page. Please find us there. Every week, our programs are live streamed, okay, but they're live, live recorded. Roger Rito records them. You can go to la2m.org slash live to watch it if you can't make it over here. And each week, Ben Shimalevsky in the back there of BC Web Design records them for podcasts. So these programs where we have these really intelligent speakers come in, at least, at least most days they're very intelligent. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, you, know, you, can, you can watch it again. And you can really go back and watch the archive, and it's like your own little personal education and marketing. Um, just to give you an idea, LHM is a nonprofit. So I'm going to let Dee say, say a word here. Um, as a nonprofit, um, we've been running for, well, we're into our fourth year, and we've been running a routine, regular educational program. As a way of saying thank you, we would like to ask you if you wish to make a donation to Lunch Ann Arbor Marketing. We recommend $3 donation, not mandatory, it's entirely optional. We do pass the basket or the bucket. Um, Stacy, our treasurer, normally fulfills this function, but she's on holiday. So if you're watching, Stacy, hi. And I'm going to pass the basket now. Thank you. Great, thanks, Dean. And just to give you an idea of format, our speaker will talk for approximately 30 minutes. There will be time for QA. Make sure you ask some really hard questions today because Sean Hickey's here. And then we like to go around the room and introduce ourselves. So you will get a chance to say who you are, uh, what you do, and you know if there's any way we can help you. We like to be brief during that introduction just because we like to get around the whole room. So without further ado, our speaker today is someone I've actually known for a long time, uh, Sean Hickey of PWB Marketing. And you're the president there, CEO? CEO? Okay, he's the COO of PWB. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, there we go. Yeah. That's a big deal. That's a BFD. Okay, so. Um, anyways, this guy rocks, and he's gonna enlighten you. So let's give him a warm round of applause for Sean Hickey. Okay, so I'm gonna start with the disclaimer portion of our program. You've had a bunch of smart speakers, and now you got me. Uh, and we're going to find out if I'm smart enough to handle a microphone, a water glass, a laptop, and what's going on up there. Uh, this is a presentation I've given to a few other groups. I reworked some stuff just for you today, so we'll see how it works. Um, as Derek mentioned, I'm Chief Operating Officer of PWB Marketing. Actually, PWB Marketing Communications when you want a full mouthful. Uh, we are principally a B2B and what we call targeted consumer uh, agency. Full service, online, offline, all that stuff. So I can go on and on about what we are, but let's talk demand generation. But first, I don't talk about fishing, because I do that a lot. i got a problem with it, actually. So anybody here actively do any fishing these days? OK, did you ever fish as a kid? All right, so we'll talk a little bit about it. So what do you think is the best place to go fishing? These are a few options. These are a few of my favorites, the Pier Marquette River, the Manistee River in the northern lower the Black River in the Eastern UP, Lake Michigan, Lake Superior. Anybody else got any favorites? You're at river for small mouth. OK, I do a little of that, too. What's the best way to catch fish? What do you think? Is it that box of flies in the snow? Dynamite. Some hardware. Dynamite's good. <laughs> Shotgun. Shotgun's nice, only in season. Is there a better season to fish? You like going in the spring? Summer, maybe when it's warm, fall, when the salmon are up there doing their thing and everybody's looking for the free meal behind them. Maybe the winter when nobody else is out there, that's my favorite time. Well, the answer is it depends. All those fish were caught on lots of different waters, all kinds of different times of year, on all the stuff you saw. So everything from my buddy Paul's little teeny tiny trout that was about that big and I had to put him in the presentation, up to my monster brown from last December. What we're going to talk a little bit about today is demand generation. And demand generation is all I like fishing. You've got to use the right tactics. You've got to have a plan. You've got to have flawless or at least pretty good execution. You've got to have some patience. 
Full metal lock probably helps in there too. And most importantly, you need to adapt to your unique situation. So today we're going to talk specifically about what do I mean when I say demand generation. A little bit about how it works, some of the pitfalls that you can run into. I'll uh, give you a few case studies to kind of show you how it's done. Uh, and then you can ask questions and hopefully stump me. That's our goal today. <laughs> demand generation is a funny term. Got real popular the last couple of years. You've probably seen it in BB and all the other marketing magazines. And what's interesting for us is as an agency, we got asked to pitch a client's demand generation business. And we kind of went, oh, what's that? This was a couple of years ago. And we looked around and we went, Oh, that's what we always did. It just has a name now. <laughs> Demand generation is marketing integrated and aligned with sales. And we're going to talk a lot about what that means. And to give you a little bit of my background, I'm a third generation salesperson. My grandfather sold radio and TV advertising for Mr. Booth of Booth Newspapers in Detroit in the 50s. And I've seen way too many marketing programs that go out there that don't really tie off with sales in any way. And that's something that I've spent a lot of time in my career trying to change among marketing folks. But demand generation, more than anything, is a philosophy. It's not a process. It's not a call center. It's not databases. It's not the Eloqua engine or double click that is built on. It's not any of those things. It's a way of thinking about how I identify, target, engage, nurture, and eventually convert prospects into sales. It's the engine that drives growth, obviously. It's nice because you've got a good DG program going. You can kind of tell what your sales pipeline looks like a whole lot better than if you don't, if you're waiting for them to show up. And it's the logical extension of integrated marketing. It's integrated marketing all grown up. Integrated marketing is really cool. You go out there in multiple channels and you respect the fact that people consume media through various venues. Okay, great. But on the other end, are you tracking how they behave? Are you tracking what they do? Are you tracking what you send to them? Are you adapting what you send to them based on what they were interested in? A lot of people that is. Once upon a time, marketing and sales were discrete activities. There was the marketing department over here and the sales department over here. My first job out of grad school, I worked for a guy. And he said, if I go on a sales call and they buy something, that's sales. And if they don't, it's marketing. <laughs> Spent my whole career trying to look that down. Obviously, sales guy. What's changed is marketing almost forms the beachhead. Marketing may be the first time that a customer experiences our brand or our company. And in today's market, marketing is doing a lot of things that used to be sales or even inside sales job. So marketing is really warming them up. So as marketing gets less involved as we go through the process, Sales gets more involved. So there's kind of a, there's sort of a handoff, but it's really more of a transition rather than in the olden days of, well, okay, that's marketing, we're done now. Demand generation is built, built on the premise that there are three answers in sales. Yes, no, and not now. Demand generation is for not now. And I'd be willing to bet in most selling situations, not now is the most common prospect. Yes, okay, easy, close them, get them a purchase order, let's go. No, uh, you ran over my dog last week, so I'll never ever buy anything from you again. Okay, cool, on to the next client. And not now, I'm not ready to buy, I don't have budget, I'm not convinced of the need, any of a variety of things. Those are the folks we want to work on. And what we want to do is we want to advance the good prospects, and we want to eliminate or grow the weak ones. We're selling enterprise software. We want to weed the students out of there because we're probably not going to sell them anything. But you know that person who says, well, I don't have budget yet this year, but they may have budget next year. And we want to make sure that next year when they have budget and they go, well, who should I talk to? Make sure it's you. So the idea is you start off with a prospect and you run them through a series of communications. And we'll talk a little bit about what that could be with the goal of going towards a sale. And if you really did it right, repeat sales, they don't come back and buy more stuff from you, that's really cool. Or they go into a drip program until you can start advancing them through the cycle. I thought it'd be helpful at least to start with, from a tactical perspective, and this is probably a little harder to read in the back of the room, but what are the elements that are in the demand generation process? So from our end, it's things like strategy and sales alignment, target list construction, who am I trying to talk to? 
content development, what am I trying to say to them? A creative platform, how am I doing that? Then you begin to outbound execute. Then you have to deal with things like response capture, nurturing and growth, um, and metrics evaluation. And, and this is a little tricky. As an agency, we kind of say, hey, this is PWB's core expertise. This is what we do and we're really good at. We can, through our partner relationships, do this last stuff. But the reality of what I've seen with demand generation programs is very few clients are willing to let go of that last piece. They usually want to do it for themselves. So we talked a little bit about sales and alignment. And uh, I had a client uh, before they started their demand generation program who uh, went back at the end of the year. And they went through and they figured out that they had run 47 marketing initiatives during the previous year. Okay, that's a problem right there. But then they went and talked to the guy who was the head of sales, and he said, they said, well, you know, how many of these actual programs do you think your guys are really working and are out there in the field doing? And he said, I don't know, probably 12. So there's 35 programs with wasted budget. Demand generation programs need to align with your strategy. You can't generate demand if you don't know what kind of demand you want to generate. For example, we're working with a local healthcare business that actually we just kind of got started with the kickoff today, and they said, we want demand generation. Okay, great. Do you want it in certain geographic areas? Do you want it in certain service lines? Do you want it with certain age demographics? Because the tactics I'm going to recommend are going to be different for each of those groups. <coughs> it should also obviously align with your sales efforts. If you go off and you build a marketing plan that's got nothing to do with the VP of Sales' program for the year, that's going to be a problem. And then finally, business cycles. Um, some businesses have lots of seasonality. Some businesses have a little bit of seasonality. For example, for this healthcare plant, one of the things they've said is summer is traditionally a slow period for them. So they want to ramp up their demand generation so that going into the summer, they got a nice full pipeline. We work for another healthcare client, uh, which I'm going to show you a case study of, who's in the weight loss industry. And for them, it's all about the new year because everybody hits January 1 and says, my huge resolution is to what? There you go. So respecting those business cycles and building those into your demand generation program, if they exist, are good things. I told you we were going to talk a little bit about content. Um, this is one of my meta messages to, to clients pretty typically. You really need to respect your audience. I don't know about you, but I do not go home and go skip into the mailbox and say, damn, another offer for replacement windows. Cool. <laughs> Your targets are not sitting there eagerly waiting for you to communicate with them. They don't want to be bombarded with information. And they're really not that interested in stuff that doesn't help them. They are, on the other hand, very interested in stuff that's relevant to their job, to their interests, to whatever. So you send me the latest Scott Flyrods catalog, and it's going to get open. You send me an offer for replacement windows. I live in a 10-year-old house. That's not going to happen. So learning those things, respecting those things. Uh, you know, we had one client who, for a while there, they were all about, uh, we've got the economics down, and we can produce postcards much cheaper. That's cool. They're easier to throw away. Recycle. Sorry, I'm in an hour. Uh, all right. So I started my career in kind of the back end of marketing, uh, call centers, databases, fulfillment, that kind of stuff. So I think of a lot of things, and, and I think of a lot of the new online tools and demand generation tools like a direct marketer. And in direct marketing, there were three really simple maxims. The list, the creative, and the offer. I don't know if you've heard of this cool new thing, it's called the internet, I think it's gonna stick. Um, I add a fourth one to that now, which is the medium. That you need to respect the channel that you're communicating with people through. You can do things in banner ads that you can't do in print ads, and you can't do things in banner ads that you can do in print ads. And things that are cool in social media don't work in advertising, and things that are cool in advertising don't work in social media. So you really need to respect those things. So what we tell people is a good touch point is, at every step, offer the right things to the right people using the right medium in a creative way. That's the key to success. Anything you do outbound, you ought to be thinking about, have I fulfilled all those categories? The other thing is, and we run into this fairly frequently, because people want to repurpose content that they already have. I already got that brochure, I can use that for this market. 
one of the things that we've seen in the selling process is people have different needs for information as they go through the journey from awareness to consideration to selection to purchase to repeat purchase. So as an example, at the awareness stage, giving me a chance to win an iPod might be enough to get me to stick my hand up. And that's cool. But if I'm down there in the selection stage and you give me a chance to win an iPod, especially if you're selling a technical product, I look at you like, you know, like your dog does when you make a funny noise. <laughs> but by the same token, give them a chance to win an average golf driver, which we're doing in a current campaign, and work great to get them to raise their hand. And then through the demand generation and through the qualification process, we can figure out which ones are good prospects and which ones are. But we need to get your name first before we can ever do that. But as the prospects move along, you know, when they get into the consideration or selection phase, they're starting to think about things like how big is it, how fast is it, will it fit in my plan, does it do all the things I need it to do, can I afford it, uh, what's the payment plan, kind of all of those things. But I don't know if any of you have had the opportunity to market products made by engineers. They want to do all that stuff in the first phase. You get these ads, and you've all seen them, that look like a pachinko machine. It's got like all the specs in the ad, not going to work. Awareness, different communication needs. How does this solve the problem that I have? Uh, a little bit of talk about metrics, and I don't want to dwell on metrics too much because you could spend your entire life hanging out in double click and omniture and everything. And the reality is the metrics that are meaningful are the metrics that are meaningful to your organization. So, for example, I work with one client where banner clicks and cost per click is all they're worried about right now. That's it. They want to optimize their media buy. Okay, great. That helps simplify the equation. But figure out up front, what am I going to want to measure? And then you can build your system around that to make sure that you're capturing things that enable you to measure that. Uh, another, another common problem that we see, um, and, and I'd offer this to both people who are on the client side of things and, and on the service provider side of things, having a feedback loop to your agency or your marketing partner if you're using one is critical. We can't make your program better if you don't let us know how it's working. And it happens. And it's not a good fact. I'm going to give you an example of a bad example. And then last but not least, data. There's a lot of discussion when you start a demand generation program over well, how much is a lead worth and, and what are best practices? And the reality is that a lead is worth what a lead is worth to you. And what you're really going to see is, over time, that you can say, well, you know, how about this medium versus this medium? Which one was more cost effective? And then also you can see trends. Hey, am I starting to burn out this piece of creative in this market? Or are people not that interested in demand generation anymore? So maybe I need to talk about branding. You know, all of those things are factors. So really what I'm, what I'm getting at with this is figure out what metrics really move the needle for your organization or your client's organization and then build back from that. It's too easy to just say, I'm going to just put all this stuff on the dashboard. And then what you do is you don't do any marketing anymore. You sit around looking at Excel spreadsheets, which is really cool, but not my thing. So I'm going to show you a few examples of some that we've done. <laughs> I'll do the easy one. This is us. This is how we go find clients. So we do all kinds of stuff. We get referrals from people. We do search marketing. We do direct mail. We do a little bit of PR. We do a white paper. We do all the social media stuff. I come out and talk and stuff like this. And the whole goal is that everybody gets done and they go look at www.pwb.com. That's, kind of, that's our collecting. And from that point, they decide, gee, I might be interested in talking to you. So pretty quickly, we're going to want to get to, are you qualified? Are you a decent prospect for us to spend time on? Do you have budget? Do you need to have an active search? Or do you just want a free lunch? You get, you get one. <laughs> Maybe. No? Well, then you're probably going in our drip program. You're going on our e-news distribution. If we write white papers that are relevant, to your industry or a topic that you express some interest in, great, cool, we're all friends. Hopefully you'll mature into a real client for us. If yes, you get the fancy brochure. Woohoo! Um, and initial meeting. If you like it, we do a proposal. 
things don't back in the drip program. So part of why I'm showing you this is not to teach you how to do business development for an agency, but you know, you're all about that cool steel mine. It's not anything overly brilliant. But to show you that a lot of demand generation is about a process. It's about thinking through what is the sequence of what happens. Okay, somebody raised their hand as a lead. Now what? Uh, years ago, I built a program for uh, Hayworth Office Furniture, and our lead qualification criteria was a series of 42 questions, because everybody contributed to this. Oddly, nobody ever completed it. I don't know. Ours, pretty simple. Got money? Need something? Are you looking for people to help you with it? So then, of course, you got to have some tools to send people. So in our case, we have a series of direct mail pieces that are tied to issues. One's on lead generation, one's on branding, uh, another one's on how to do how to integrate your marketing efforts. We also do a monthly e-newsletter that probably some of you here get. And then from time to time, uh, because we got all the answers to everything in the world, we go write a white paper about it. Um, so this one, for example, is for uh, outdoor enthusiast marketing. You know, we've got one on uh, green technology. We've got a few others. And those are nice to kind of continue the conversation in a little more detailed way, but without bugging people. Does it work? We haven't won it yet, but we got to pitch an insurance company prospect that we talked to like three years ago. And at the time, actually, kind of tragic story, their, their president died suddenly. And they, just, they said, we can't think about marketing right now. We got to... Two and a half years later, they called up and said, hey, we've been getting your e-newsletters all along now. You know, we're, we're kind of ready to talk to some agencies. That's the goal, is we're looking for the not now person. Uh, this one's way more glamorous. Uh, one of our largest clients is a division of Siemens that makes uh, PLM software, uh, which is the artist formerly known as CAD. It's CAD all grown up. But this stuff's pretty cool. Uh, any cool product that you have in your household is probably designed on their software. If you drove here in a Ford or a GM, your car was designed on their software. But one of the products is designed for small and medium-sized businesses. Product called Solid Edge, kind of mid-level CAD solution. The problem is they have two competitors who own 80% of the market. They just weren't even getting into sales dialogue. They just weren't even getting the chance. And what's interesting about it is they have a way better product than the competitors. They just didn't have the market share. So what we did was to help them come up with a creative platform and then execute it in multiple outbound channels that started to break through to say. Don't just buy the other guy because it's bigger. Look at what's better. So we started with an original program, um, and this was this was kind of funny. When the client originally came to us, they said, you know, we have uh, better technology, better support, and a better migration path for the future. And we'd like to test those three variables in a direct mail program. And we said, well, A, the universe isn't big enough to do a meaningful test, and B, any one of those benefits really isn't enough to get somebody to say, I'm going to pop five grand for some software. So we came up with this platform that was built actually on all three. So it was principally rolled out in direct mail. And, and by the way, I talked about the offer. So the offer that we dreamed up with them was come to one of 16 seminars around the country and sit down and take a test drive. And you can see how solid it is better than solid works. We'll show you. And we'll buy lunch. So that was done in banners, in, in uh, uh, email blasts, uh, in traditional snail mail blasts, a little bit in advertising will work so well, eventually we kind of stepped it up and said, no, you really should. we went out with the dare, the dare to compare message um, and another series of events. Well, this one I've actually got really good metrics for. So did it work? We nearly doubled the lead volume over the previous campaign. <coughs> we, uh, we generated attendance at 203 seminars, 191 test drives, 23 webcasts, over th uh, 36 lots new events, and we put over 6.4 million impressions in the market in about a six month period. Not bad. And not by spending excessively, because our competitors far outspent us. What were Good, solid positioning. The client trusted us. They let us come up with a position that delivered a competitive advantage. They integrated it and delivered it across multiple channels. Unfortunately, there are a few things that didn't work. Um, any of you uh, in the service provider side of things got clients who have marketing ADD? Oh, shiny penny. 
Yep, this one really never got to run for long enough to really find out if it works. And that was one thing that I didn't put on the slide, but um, about the time that you or your client is just completely sick of your message, the marketplace has just almost started to notice it. Mm -hmm. And that was a problem with these guys. And then the other part was that legal got involved. If you've ever had the pleasant experience of working with a large company's legal department, you know. <laughs> the other thing is, if you sell a product through an independent distribution channel, you can't always control the stupid stuff they'll do. Like that. This was one of our resellers in the UK. They took the Dare to Compare platform in, well, a little different direction. <laughs> we love Clucky. Clucky's an in-house agency joke now. Um, we like that they took the Dare to Compare idea, but yeah. But this is a worthwhile thing to talk about because I think probably a lot of you, and I notice a lot of people in Ann Arbor are in situations where you sell through an independent channel. It may be an insurance company who sells through agents. It may be a manufacturer who has to sell through manufacturer's reps. But understanding that channel and making sure you give them things that they'll actually use is a good idea. Uh, these guys were in Denmark. We're blaming the language barrier. Uh, BTC, this actually is, this is an old one because these guys aren't even called BTC anymore. They're now called Barracks Clinics, not our idea. Um, and they were our original demand generation client. We started doing demand generation for these guys, gosh, 15 years ago probably. And they had a machine. They were the nation's leading provider of surgical weight loss solutions. So this is the, the uh, it's the folks over in MC, actually. Um, it's the same procedure Al Roker had and Carney Wilson. And they had a model. I mean, they had a model for getting people from generating, you know, generating awareness and generating leads, getting them into the call center, working them towards a consult, and having, having surgery. The problem is, right in the middle of that, this internet thing came along. And the internet was target made for weight loss surgery. Because it's an anonymous way for people to raise their hands and say, I'd like to lose some weight. There's a lot of stigma associated with it. You know, for years, we couldn't use direct mail with them because how do you send a direct mail that says, we know you're fat? <laughs> you get the data, by the way, you can get the data really easy. All you got to do is go to Polk and, and, and rent the driver's license data. Pipe, wait, run the algorithm, we know you're fat. <laughs> So we built them a customizable online tool. What they do is they come into a market with print ads, broadcast ads, online ads, direct mail, and they tended to they open a center, for example, in Phoenix, and then they kind of draw concentric circles around it for where they were trying to generate demand from. Uh, you know, they did the same thing in Columbus and a few other places. So they run these ads, and what we built for them is a product we called MyBTCInfo.com. It was one of the earliest database generated websites that we knew of. <clears throat> and it enabled you to customize your message. So if you were doing a New Year's push in Cleveland, you could go to a landing page that actually said something about that. And this is in the days before people figured out that when you click on them, actually a lot of people still haven't figured it out. I love the experience of so you click on a banner ad and go to a home page. What the hell just happened here? <laughs> That was a problem for these guys. So what we were able to do was very quickly and easily generate campaigns that said, okay, this is the New Year's program in Columbus, and put those up, no muss, no fuss, all built on a database. So once that happened, you went into the, you went into the qualification process. Uh, and primarily their questions were, do you have insurance, and do you have height weight, or do you have a BMI that that's, uh, says you're morbidly obese? In their case, if you didn't have insurance, they didn't want to deal with you. <clears throat> so yes, Wahoo, you get the big brochure. You go through the consult process. And these guys, I'll tell you what, these are one, they ran their own call center. These guys had it down. If they had a surgeon in Columbus who was going to be on vacation the second week in July, they could back it all the way up and figure out, I need to run fewer ads in Dayton in March. It was, when, you, when you're doing this right, it's pretty cool. If not, if not, due to insurance, you're out. And if not, for other reasons, you go into our direct mail drip program. And we don't need to make any of the jokes. We already made them all. Um, what we found with them was this enabled us to integrate lots and lots of different types of creative, from banner ads, 
print ads, uh, other online ads, e-newsletters, and very easily have people go to a very targeted um, landing page that talk to the message that brought them there in the first place. So the results were a few things. One, they were able to get in market with uh, regional and issue-focused campaigns very quickly. Two, obviously, the ability to deliver messages that, again, help people walk through the process. And then finally, and probably most importantly, is it really streamlined their media optimization. They got their, their cost per lead down to $62 for print, down to $36 for uh, TV, and down to $12 for online. This is about half what they had been doing before. Um, and in this business, you know, that's all about, the, that's all about how the business model works. When you're talking about a $40,000 surgery, 62 bucks at least pretty good. One last one. Uh, we worked with a client in the industrial liquid filtration industry. They forgot to tell me in grad school that I wasn't going to get to work on cool stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. This is the least visually interesting product I have ever worked on. But these guys had a really cool product that they figured out was really good for manufacturing paint. Paint is the nastiest industrial thing you'll ever filter because it dries and it clogs and it makes a mess. And I don't have bought paint lately. It's expensive. So you don't want to be throwing it away. Well, they figured out that they had a product that was really good. So they came to us and said, can you get us going in the paint industry? So we built them an integrated outbound program that included trade advertising, uh, print direct mail to multiple rented lists, all coded back to what the source was and did all the good you know, direct mail marketing modeling, uh, HTML emails to rented lists, banners, and then, of course, the dedicated landing and capture page. Paint doesn't have to be ugly. You can take cool pictures and tune it up a lot. And that really was the goal. <clears throat> the landing page you'll see on the left, the print ad, uh, and then the direct mail piece. So what worked? Well, a multimedia campaign worked very well. The direct mail list worked fantastically. The integrated message seemed to get people through all channels. And there really was a compelling benefit. What didn't work is our client marketing didn't tell anybody in sales they were running this program. Yeah. <laughs> and when the leads came in, nobody in sales knew what to do and nobody was tracking anything. Uh, the good news is that six months after this, they saw a giant increase in their sales in the bank market, so something worked. <coughs> so, uh, oh, come on, right, I'm out of time. Awesome, look how that worked out. Uh, demand generation. What we say about how to do it right, take your prospects on a messaging journey. You need to really think through where do they go from when they first become aware of you all the way through what it would take for them to purchase you, and how do those communications needs change over time. Build in meaningful metrics. How do you know if it worked? You know, our, an old PWB mantra is do more of what worked and less of what doesn't. Seems obvious, but a lot of people can't figure that out. Establish a process at the outset. Again, like I talked about earlier, what happens when somebody sticks their hand up in the early? What? How do you handle a hot lead versus a warm lead? Now, what's the difference there? Respect your unique product or service. And and I've talked. You know, the title of this was B two B demand generation and fishing too. Um, but a lot of these principles apply to a lot of consumer products too. So you know, if you kind of think about it in those terms of how somebody goes through that sort of journey. Uh, you know, that's, that's very helpful. And then finally, don't have ADD. Don't take your eye off the ball. That doesn't mean you got to lock in on one direction and stay with that. But what it does mean is don't just ping pong from program to program. And if you do it right, catch more and bigger fish. There you go. That's what I got today. So questions, comments, random heckling. Chad said he was going to heckle, so that's cool. He didn't do it yet. You had uh, said that you had doubled the, uh, the lead generation. Did you get any uh, feedback on conversion? At that point, they didn't have the tools in place to measure the conversions. Uh, they do now. And in fact, I was hoping to upgrade that case study. We've got a new program that we have just started with them uh, on a case study on a program they did for Adams Golf. And so far, we found some really interesting things out. One of the things we found out with the Adams Golf case is print works. 
Like, we can quantify it. We got more, uh, essentially we drive people to a landing page with a form for them to complete so they can get to an asset. And uh, we got more completed forms from print than we did from banner ads. Which actually kind of surprised me, but it's mm. nice to now have a number when people say, print doesn't work, I can say, oh yeah. So, short answer, no. <clears throat> Do you have any ability to uh, distinguish unique hits on the 6.4 million number you used earlier? Again, not really. <clears throat> One of the things that we're finding about demand generation programs is you'll learn a lot about your infrastructure. You'll learn a lot about where you don't have the tools in place to capture information. We're doing, we're in the midst of, with the Siemens division, we're in the midst of, we're, we're probably really six months into the thick of it, of, a much more robust demand generation system. And it's cool, I mean, we're learning some really neat things and it's changing our creative approaches and our strategies. But one of the biggest things that we're learning, and I've seen this with a lot of other clients, is you find out where the holes are in the system. Um, earlier you talked about how there's three responses, yes, no, and not, not now. now. And that not now kind of broke into, I don't have a budget, uh, and the other one being, I don't need it, or I don't think I need it. Mm -hmm. um, could you say a little bit about your philosophy in approaching like a product that uh, has that, you know, there might be targeting people who um, your client thinks, that they don't think they need the product, but that's their challenge. Is, well, you know what I mean? To, to yeah, that's, that's actually, it, as an agency, that's a, a challenge we face pretty frequently. Because, for example, you may have a solution for a category that didn't even exist. Mm -hmm. The Siemens guys sell, uh, they sell a product uh, called digital manufacturing. It's kind of like CAD for manufacturing. You can build your factory digitally, simulate workflow, everything, to optimize it. And the reality is that most manufacturing organizations don't even know they need it. So really what that means is that, that really leans back on your grip cycle. That means if they don't understand it, you've got to help them understand it. You've got to help them understand, look, I know you're doing this in 22 Excel spreadsheets right now, but there's a way better way. You know, I worked with a client in the plastics industry years ago, and their biggest competition was legal pads. My client was a data collect statistical process control company, and what they did was collect the data from your manufacturing op organization to help you optimize workflow. Well, everybody in the world was doing it on a legal pad on a clipboard out on the shop floor. So that would be a good approach when you're sort of, in a way, uh, trying to educate. Yeah, evangelizing is kind of what we call it, yeah. So you might start more with money to the grip than other... For us, in a lot of cases, at the awareness phase, it really goes back to figuring out what is the pain point. How do you come up with something where they go, yeah, I got that problem. I hate when that happens. And then you can start to engage them in a dialogue of, oh, I'd like to not have that problem. You know, it's the, what is it, Dale Carnegie? Yeah. If there was a way... Question on databases. You know, when you go out and purchase a database for business to business, you know, I've had the philosophy of, you know, title slugging because people change positions so often. And sometimes it's maybe better to leave the previous person's name on it, knowing that it'll go to their successor and they'll respond to it. What's your what's your thoughts on that? I heard a statistic once that business to business databases go stale at a at a rate of 1% per week. If that number's even half true, that just terrifies me. Um, I, I think that might be a little aggressive, but you know, downsizing, mergers, consolidation, it might be. Uh, I would say in that situation, databases are all about hygiene. They are all about how much is the owner of the database investing in keeping that database current. So that's really where I suggest that people do their due diligence, is they go to the organizations that are really good at it. Uh, until recently, until Reed kind of blew up, um, if you were in business to business, the DM2 division of Reed was awesome. Because Reed publishes a bunch of magazines that are all audited, and once a year, they got to contact everybody and make sure they're still there. Those are a good source. I'm, I'm generally a big fan of magazines or other audited advertising vehicles lists because, by law, if qualify for the audit, they got to update their circulation, and they have to invest in it. So it really, it, it, at the end of the day, I think for me it goes back to asking that list holder, well, okay, how do you qualify your list? 
Um, there are other vehicles too, though. You know, some of the new things, some of the stuff that's going on with LinkedIn, the advertising you can do on LinkedIn, it's almost direct mail. I mean, you can go in and say, I'm interested in people with this title at this size of company uh, who've been in business for this long, who have this degree, and you can serve banner ads only to those people. That's that's kind of a cool new use of the media. It's not cheap, but it's cheap on a cost per thousand basis, but we're doing an experiment right now, and I think the initial experiment was $25,000 for two weeks. That's a lot of money. <coughs> Others? Nobody stumped me yet. Come on. No happy <laughs> Jeez, you're too nice. Okay. Well, okay. What kind of bait did you use to catch that one? <laughs> that one? Uh, that was caught on an egg fly. That's, a, that's about an 11 pound steel head I caught in Manistee in December. Are you worried about Asian carp? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, I got, I got a bunch of buddies who were fly fishing guides, and I was out with one of them actually the day I caught this fish, and I said, you know, John, you better stop all this steelhead and trout crap, and you better get your Asian carp program dialed in. The problem is that Asian carp don't eat fly, they don't eat stuff that other fish do, they're filter feeders. So, you just gotta jump in like those rednecks with the catfish down south. <laughs> There's not a phenomenon I don't really understand. <laughs> Saw one other hand float around here. All right. Thanks for coming out. Give a big round of applause. I thought that was pretty interesting. I thought that was very, very, very interesting. Yeah. And that's that's why we love Elliot Twin. Thanks, Sean. Because you learn something. You know, I learned a lot. And uh, so, nice job. I learned that I can manage a microphone, a water glass, and a laptop. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And you walked. Yeah. And I didn't drink. If I throw gum in the equation, it would have been all over. Right. Hey, so we're about to do the introductions. The question is, anyone here going to that Future Midwest conference? A few of you? Okay. It's not too late to go to that. It's Friday, Saturday, out at Royal Oak, futuremidwest.com. That's going to be a pretty cool event. Um, there's actually flyers on the table, too, for a Women Making Connections event. I'm assuming most of the women know about this, but um, Tammy will mention it, too. This is going on next Wednesday. Uh, here and in my building, two doors down. So that'll be fun. And, um, and, and it's not for women only, right? It's not for women only. Oh, there's one more thing going on though. I said I'd mention today. Startup Week in Detroit is happening May 14th, 15th, and 16th. I don't know if any of you were at Startup Week in Ann Arbor, some of you, right? So the one in Detroit's going on, and you can check it out, just Google it, all right? So now we kind of go around the room, you know, give us your name, your company, and briefly if we can help you with anything, and then pass the mic to a friend. And we'll start with Don Klein. Hi everybody, I'm Don Klein from Floating Artists. Uh, we're a music booking agency right down the street, headquartered here in Ann Arbor. Uh, just opened an office in New York, and also have an office in Melbourne, Australia. And I'm happy to be back at la 2 after missing a few weeks because we've been ramping up the New York office. Hi, Joel Bergen. I do internet marketing, uh, consulting for uh, small businesses. Uh, Put that uh, kind of on the side burner for a while with the latest project of mine called dishfish.net, which uh, helps businesses get uh, normally referring customers uh, from uh, the nonprofit organizations and school groups and such that uh, where they know each other. I'm Chad Rebusick. I'm with uh, Ann Arbor Ad Club. Uh, and, uh, tomorrow evening, the founder of Arcadia AL, which is a Michigan <coughs> Battle Creek microbrewery, is speaking at the Heidelberg from 5.30 to 7. And Arcadia Ale recently went through a uh, rebranding exercise. So he's going to kind of give us a behind the curtain look at what, uh, you know, how they went through that rebranding and how, principally how they promote their beer to stand out against a mod of mainstream beers like Coors, or Bush, Budweiser. That's tomorrow, 5.30 Heidelberg. Hi, I'm John Polnarowski from Karma CRM. That's a web-based CRM software, helping your business have more business, close more sales, and streamline your sales process. Hi, I'm Anne Marie Gatsby. I used to work at Protest and email marketing. I'm currently looking for new opportunities. Hi, Tom Crawford. I run a company called Viz Networks, and we help you learn how to communicate better. Good afternoon. I'm JT Peterson. I'm currently looking for an opportunity as a product manager in the software and software as a service arena. Hi, uh, 
Um, hi, I'm Jane Delancey, Delancey Design, and we work with making you look good, whether it's in print or on the web. And so when Sean talks about the creative side, that's, um, that's our area. Um, making you look good, it's Delancey Design. Hi, I'm uh, Krishna Malia with the Batteries Plus. This topic interested me, so I thought I'd come in. Hi, I'm Sally Brayton-Nuris, and I'm a um, business leader with the finance and accounting um, competency. And um, I have a consulting firm where I offer services to growing companies to help you plan and structure your growth. So I'm looking for, for new clients. Hi, uh, my name is Joey Sylvian. I have a company called Social Orgs. I do social media and marketing. I'm Dave DeWitt from Advanced Marketing Partners in Livonia. We're a print company that is migrating into the marketing arena and adding value to our customers. Hi, I'm Tammy Burgess with Women Making Connections, and I just would like to repeat what Derek said. We'd like to invite everyone to join us next Wednesday. 3.30, we're talking here, cracking the connection code, and then 4 to 7 is a networking event at the two locations. So, womenmakingconnections.com. Thanks. I'm Benjamin Baruch. I do advanced analytics. I help you turn your data into information, use your data strategically, um, and help build analytic capabilities. <coughs> Hi, I'm Kathy Sazinski, a marketing consultant at RJ Conlin, Marketing and Design. Hi, I'm Peter Clay, Director of Business Development at Parrish Advertising and Design, just a few blocks over. Hi, I'm Steve Califf, and I provide CFO consulting services to early stage companies. So examples would be interim or part-time CFO, uh, building financial models, fundraising help, and a business advisor. Thanks. Hi, I'm Jackie Litters. I'm an account executive with MLive.com. Um, it's my job to bring in revenue to the Ann Arbor office across the east side of the state of Michigan. Um, what I liked today was Sean spoke my language 100%, and I know exactly where he's coming from. I have five years on the agency side, so I work with small to large clients who are looking to tap into the digital world and figure out how to spend their money wisely, whether it be on MLA or across an ad network or search engine marketing. So I really help to consult and not just sell them something. I want something to work for them and build a bigger partnership. And whether they're in that drip stage or not, you know, I'll, I'll wait for them and try to mold them into the right mind frame of online marketing. So Jackie Litters, MLA.com. I'm Roger Rail. Uh, I help people with their information infrastructure. And I record various things. By the way, uh, next Tuesday is the, this month's A2 New Tech at the Law Auditorium at the Business School. And that'll also be streamed live and recorded, but it, it's always good to go in person to watch uh, four or five startups talk about their business plans and, and you can ask them questions and stump them. I'm also uh, teaching a couple courses on Google Earth uh, in May and June, one for uh, lay people and, and citizen advocates. And then one for educators and teachers, how to use Google Earth in the classroom. So it's, it's, I mean, there's so many uses that people don't understand. You can use Google Earth for for your businesses and for your your family events and things like that. So uh, check it out. It's at WCC on their uh, uh, continuing education. Thanks. Hi, I'm Anita Mitzel, and I have a company called Graphic Color Exhibits, and we help people have successful trade shows. Uh, by helping to come up with a concept and design a trade show booth that uh, works with their message. Uh, also counseling them to uh, work the booth effectively uh, and to do the things that they should be doing to achieve the best results. Uh, we do everything from concept and design right through uh, uh, execution and we also handle trade show services, uh, logistics and uh, uh, labor and so forth. My name is Janice Milham with Milham and Images, and my company helps businesses articulate the visual essence of their, of their um, companies. So I help work with um, images and work with words to make a story for a company. 
Um, I'll be delivering a workshop, uh, actually a session next week at LA2M, and it's going to be on visual storytelling. So I'm going to talk about some of the do's and don'ts and how to uh, really shine in terms of your visual presence in the marketplace. Thank you. My name is Paul Hickman. I have a art design services uh, business here in Ann Arbor. I'm also a board member of Think Local First. Um, this is about my third or fourth one that I've come to, and I keep coming because uh, one of the main things I'm doing right now is I'm in the process of launching a uh, whole new home furnishings line called Urban Ashes, and I'm also, I also want to keep the awareness out to all the folks in the general area about Think Local First supporting uh, locally owned and independently operated businesses. If anybody's interested in talking to me about that, uh, please talk to me afterwards. Hello, Laura Spensley with Surfco Canton and Surfco Washington County. If spring rains, rains flood your home or business, no shine, making your loss like it never even happened. Hi, my name is Ellen Gannell. I'm with the Carytown Concert House. We're at the intimate concert venue in the Carytown District that plays world-class music. We're also a venue if you're interested in holding business meeting or party. Um, we're a uh, perfect um, space for that as well. Just give us a call. Uh, my name is Sasha Schlinghoff, and um, I'm an account manager at uh, eSearch Vision. We're a paid search company here in Ann Arbor, and uh, we have offices all around the world, and we handle paid search for uh, medium to large businesses. I'm Scott Watchman, also an account manager at eSearch Vision. Uh, pretty much heard that story. We also do technology licensing for uh, some agencies, if anyone is interested in that as well. I'm Eric Rodriguez, Client Services Manager with Genix Digital Marketing. Carter Sherling from Print Studios. I do commercial editorial portrait photography, which ranges from individual Im images of individuals to products to locations to events. All right, and I'm Derek Maribond, CEO of Genix Digital Marketing. I'd like to say we have used Surf Pro. That's Laura's company. They did a great job when our basement flooded. So call them first. Yeah, don't wait a few days to debate it. Yeah. Call them quickly. But uh, yeah, my company does uh, internet marketing. We build websites. We optimize them. You all know this. Uh, but for those of you watching the live stream in Australia, give us a call. <laughs> and uh, right, so now D. Davies going to close the meeting. Hi, I'm Dee Davey, Creative Ideas Marketing. I'm an independent marketing contractor specializing in services marketing. I help overstretched and under-resourced marketing managers get marketing projects off their desk. I step in and fulfill one-off marketing assignments that do not require the investment of a full-time resource. I help development teams launch and uh, create and launch new service products for revenue, and I help marketing agencies get under the skin of their clients, teasing out key messaging and identifying new opportunities for marketing assignments and business development. D. Davey, Creative Ideas Marketing. I'm also the voice of Lunch Ann Arbor Marketing, and it's my pleasure to reiterate Janice Milhelm's um, introduction. She will be joining us next week, talking about telling your story visually. So join us at Lunch and Arbor Marketing, April 21st. See you then. Bye.